is Jenna Weiss, and I'm the Assistant Director of Public Programs at the Jewish Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's conversation, Art, Assimilation, and Reclaiming a Stolen Legacy, featuring authors Lisa Barr and James McCauley, moderated by Stephanie Butnick. Unpacking the book, Jewish Writers in Conversation, is co-presented by the Jewish Museum, Jewish Book Council, and Tablet Magazine. We would like to thank the Rita J. and Stanley H. Kaplan Foundation, whose generous endowment support makes the Saul and Gladys Wurtzman Lecture possible each year. If this is your first time attending and unpacking the book event, you can watch many of our past programs on Jewish Book Council's YouTube page. After the event, please visit the Jewish Museum's website to sign up for our e-news for information on all of our upcoming events, including the final Unpacking the Book talk on Thursday, May 12th. Tonight's talk is planned in conjunction with the exhibition, The Hair with Amber Eyes, on view through May 15th, and we encourage you to visit if you are able to do so. We also offer virtual tours for groups of any size, so come with your book club, tickets and more information at thejewishmuseum.org slash visit. Closed captioning is available tonight for those who wish to use it. Simply click on the CC icon at the bottom of your screen to watch the event with captions turned on. Before we begin, I would like to introduce Naomi Firestone Teeter, Executive Director of Jewish Book Council, to share a little bit more about tonight's program. Thank you, Jenna. I'm so pleased to be able to welcome you this evening on behalf of Jewish Book Council. We're thrilled to present the Unpacking the Book series for its, for its eighth year in partnership with the Jewish Museum and Tablet Magazine. Each program we've offered in the series brings together authors who approach similar, similar subject matter through their own unique lens, whether that's through varying personal experiences, perspectives, or genre. Tonight, we will explore the history and legacy of looted art during the Holocaust with our 2021 National Jewish Book Award winner for history, James McCauley, author of The House of Fragile Things, Jewish Art Collectors, and The Fall of France, and New York Times bestselling author of Woman on Fire, Lisa Barr. We're honored to bring together these two impressive authors for a discussion with our always brilliant moderator, Stephanie Butnick. Our mission at Jewish Book Council is to educate, enrich, and strengthen the community through Jewish literature. You can visit our website to learn more about our reviews, essays, and paper brigade, our book club resources and author tours, and our literary awards, including the National Jewish Book Awards and Etan Notable Books. I hope you'll check out all of our programs, events, and resources, and consider becoming a member to support JBC's continued initiatives. Before we begin tonight's program, I'd like to very quickly thank the Jewish Museum, and specifically Jenna Weiss, and our media sponsor, Tablet Magazine, the premier publication of Jewish news and ideas in the US. A very special thank you as well to Evie Sapphire Bernstein, Jewish Book Council's program director, for managing all the ins and outs of tonight's program and series. And I'm especially grateful to JBC's Board of Directors for their continued support of Jewish literature, ideas, and conversation. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. If you would like to ask a question of our panelists, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Please also be on the lookout in the chat for links to purchase this evening's books. I hope you will purchase both of our panelists' books if you have not already done so. And please note that if you do need captions, you can add them by clicking on the bottom of the screen. And now I'd like to introduce Stephanie. Stephanie Butnick is the deputy editor of Tablet Magazine and a host of its weekly podcast, Unorthodox. She is the author, along with her co-host, of the newest Jewish encyclopedia, From Abraham to Zabars and Everything in Between. Thank you so much for joining us, and please enjoy the evening. Thank you, Naomi and Jenna and Evie and the whole team behind um, this wonderful series from the Jewish Book Council and the Jewish Museum. I am delighted to be here with all of you tonight and with two wonderful authors, Lisa Barr and James McCauley. Lisa Barr is the award-winning author of The Unbreakables, Fugitive Colors, and now Woman on Fire. She's worked at the Jerusalem Post, Moment Magazine, and the Chicago Sun-Times. And she 
and she covered the famous handshake between the late Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, the late PLO leader Yasser Arafat, and President Bill Clinton at the White House. Um, and I have some, some breaking news to share, some book news to share, which is that actress Sharon Stone is set to produce and star in the film adaptation of Woman on Fire. So we will have a lot to discuss with her. We are also here with James McCauley. He's a Washington Post Global Opinions contributing columnist focusing on French and European politics and culture. He's formerly a Paris correspondent for the Washington Post. He's a contributor to the New York Review of Books and holds a PhD in French history from the University of Oxford, where he was a Marshall Scholar and where this book, The House of Fragile things got its start as his dissertation. Lisa and James, welcome. Thank you so much for having us. It's great to be here with you. Wonderful to be here. Thanks, Stephanie. We are going to have a lot of fun. Um, tonight's discussion is called Art Assimilation and Reclaiming a Stolen Legacy. That is a big topic. Um, and it's something that each of your books get at um, in, a, in a very different way. Um, James, your book is a, you know, a brilliant historical, uh, historical account. Lisa, your book is a, an art world thriller, um, but there's so much that these books both, um, both touch on and we'll get to all of that and we'll get to the audience questions. We'll talk about Chicago, where both of you seem to sort of somehow be from. Um, we were talking about that a lot earlier. So drop your Chicago questions in the Q&A box. Drop your questions about both of these books, about anything that comes up. And at the end of the event, we'll sort of get, get to audience questions as well. So it's really exciting to be here with both of you. The thing I like, the thing that I kept thinking about as I was reading it, is sort of like if there was Netflix for books, after you read one of your books, I think it would say sort of like, if you like that, you might also be interested in this and sort of funnel you from one to the other, because as I said, you know, there are so many parallels. So let's let's get started. I'd love for each of you to tell us a bit about your book and and read us a short passage. James, why don't you kick us off? Sure. Um, so first of all, thank you so much to the Jewish Museum and to Tablet um, and especially Stephanie for having us all here tonight. It is great to, um, to, to, to be with you, especially after this sort of long and endless COVID period. And Lisa, I so admire your writing and it's just, it's great to be here um, with you tonight. Um, yeah, so like Stephanie said, The House of Fragile Things, my book grew out of the PhD dissertation in history that I wrote um, when I was in Oxford. And essentially it began um, years before that, when I was a child, I was sort of dragged along with my parents, or by my parents, I should say, to see the Camondo Museum in Paris, which I'm sure many of our um, audience members have visited or are familiar with. And it's this just absolutely stunningly beautiful kind of jewel box museum on the Parc Monceau in Paris. And at the time, and this has since changed, but at the time, you know, um, this would have been in, I think, maybe the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, when I first visited, it was a beautiful museum of 18th century French um, art objects, paintings, um, the works, so to speak. And, you know, everything about it was immaculate. And it's like this, um, stage set for dangerous liaisons or something just like abs I mean right out of central casting for sort of France before the 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 French Revolution and I guess I um I, I there's a part of the the path of the museum where you can go upstairs and see some of the rooms that belong to the family that that um, amassed the collection and then ultimately donated the collection to the state and that's where I became fascinated and haunted because the family that donated the museum, the Camondo family, um, essentially no longer exists because it was, or they were um, sort of rounded up and murdered by the Nazis during the war. And there was very little trace of that. And I just, I sort of became haunted by their story. And I just knew then, even at the age of 12 or something, the way you just know when you have to write about something. And it became a kind of um, uh, obsession. Um, and when I was a PhD student, I just, I spent years in archives tracing down every little letter or bit and piece of the story I could find. And that's really the book. And what I learned in doing the book is that it wasn't just the Kemondo. So they, um, you know, they were a sort of Turkish Jewish family, very prominent in finance in the mid 19th century, very much sort of on the social scene in Paris. But 
there were so many others like them that were intermarried with them. And it was really this whole sort of social world of these Jewish collecting families that all, uh, one after the other, left their collections to France in the 1920s and 30s before the Second World War. And that to me was fascinating. It's, it's a pattern that starts to reappear. And then you ask yourself, what's really going on here? And I just got really interested in the psychology of collecting what the art was meant to say beyond you know, the message of the particular works themselves. And also the question of legacy and loss and sort of what remains of these families, what are we coming at it as we do after the Holocaust to see in the collections. And it just, um, it became this kind of maze that I sort of feel still stuck in, if I'm honest. I mean, you just keep kind of, I'm sure it's the same for Lisa. You just kind of, once you get down the research rabbit hole, it's hard to get out of it. So that's the genesis of the book. Can we share a, a brief reading oh, yes, with of our course. audience? Um, so this is just a little snippet from the introduction to give you a taste of, of what it's all about. So I'll, I'll begin reading now. The collections they left behind are testimonies to the specific people they were, but also to the proud identity that this milieu sought to build, Jewish and French, particular and universal. Granted, in the commoditized fin de siècle, Jews were far from the only elites who embraced collecting as a bourgeois sport and pastime, and nor were they necessarily unique in terms of the particular items they sought. But for them, collecting bore special significance, as numerous archival materials show, in the wake of various personal tragedies and in the midst of a vocal anti-Semitism that reached a fever pitch during the Dreyfus Affair, the objects they arranged and the homes they designed provided a profound sense of solace and sanctuary. In the private spaces they created, they had total control and absolute authority, a security they never enjoyed in the outside world. In their public lives, material culture was perhaps even more important. In the age of the salon, the barrier between private and public was never a fixed one, and it was through the projection of their collections that members of this French Jewish establishment sought to present themselves and their values to the world. The relationship of Jews to art collecting is an admittedly vast and sprawling subject, and there are several well-known French collectors whose stories I will not tell here. But this is merely because I've chosen to explore the milieu whose members left their collections to the state as a means of shaping its cultural legacy. They may have sought to do so in different ways and with different politics in mind, but each of these collections was a profound statement, a love letter to France and a subtle attempt to write Jews into France's roman national or national narrative. Those Jewish chapters remain today, even if the families that left them behind do not. The terrible end of the story should obscure neither the bravery nor the beauty of what they built together, even if that edifice turned out to be a house of fragile things. Thank you. Um, Lisa, will you tell us a bit about your book and read us a short passage? Oh, I think, I think you're muted, which means we're on a Zoom, right? Am I <laughs> not, am I good? Can you hear me? All right. So um, thank you and thank you to the Jewish Museum and Tablet and the Jewish Book Council. And James, you know, I've been telling you over and over, I loved your book. I feel like it's a masterwork and a must read uh, in the world of stolen art. So just kudos to you. It was fabulous. And it's all highlighted all over the place, uh, my copy. Anyway, um, Woman on Fire. So I wrote Woman on Fire during COVID lockdown. And I was working, you know, 10 hours a day, seven days a week, writing this book. And it's about, it's a ripping tale of a young savvy journalist, 24 years old from Chicago, uh, who gets embroiled in a major international art scandal centered around a Nazi looted painting. And it's basically how far will she go to get the painting back? And the bigger question for the readers is, uh, is you know, what is the fine line between the pursuit of justice and the hunt for revenge? And for me as a writer, uh, it had all the goodies that I love to read and write, you know, stolen art, history, suspense, passion, risky journalistic pursuits, and of course, strong, fiery women. And, um, 
I was inspired, you know, just I come from a news background and, you know, usually my work is inspired by some sort of news story or a hook. And so when I read this one particular story, I literally had a visceral reaction, you know, entirely through my body and I knew I had found my story. So briefly in 2013, uh, in a rundown apartment in, in Munich, it was discovered uh, 1,500 masterpieces inside this old man's dilapidated apartment. And literally in his food cabinet, layered like lasagna in the stove. And we're talking Chagall and Matisse, Picasso. And it turns out that this reclusive old man was the son of Hildebrand Gerlitt, who was Hitler's art thief. So my book begins there. And it's in, you know, it's a fictional account inspired by this event. And basically my very ruthless, unscrupulous art dealer, Margot de Laurent is stealing from Carl Geisler, um, who is inspired by Cornelius Gerlitt. So here's the scene and uh, got to slip on the glasses. So hang on. All right. So Margot, and that's her name, Margot pauses, thinking again of her beloved grandfather, Charles de Laurent, who died when she was 12. If only he could see her now, art dealer turned burglar. She'd argue that this was not a robbery, but self-defense. Stealing from someone who stole the art is not a crime, but payback. Helmut Geisler and his Nazi cohorts confiscated many of her grandfather's paintings back in Paris during the war, but not everything. Her brilliant grandfather, always one step ahead, saw the writing on the wall. He heard the stories from his colleagues and clients in Berlin and Munich, whose collections had been confiscated or destroyed. He was determined to protect the vast de Laurent collection well before the Nazis banged down his gallery door. And when they did, he was prepared when they stormed his gallery nearly a year prior to the Nazi invasion of Paris, demanding he hand over his massive trove. He told Margot that he was forced to give those criminals 300 major works of art, but had already saved more than 2000 masterworks from the family collection. He'd sent them first to the south of France for protection. And from there, the paintings were smuggled to Lisbon, London, and New York for safekeeping, except for one painting the one that his beloved but sick young wife, Sylvie, had treasured the most. He'd mistakenly hung on to it too long and was too late when he tried to save it from the bloodthirsty Helmut Geisler. Her grandfather never got over the loss. So. Thank you both. You know, it's really, really interesting because what comes up in both of your books and what I'd really like us to talk about is this sort of like cultural elite, right? These, these were, cultural, cultured cosmopolitan Jews who were collecting paintings, they were um, the subjects of paintings, they were being painted, they, they were sort of in this in this world. And, you know, we all sort of know how that story ends. But I'd like to sort of um, go back to the beginning. James, can you root us in this post French Revolution, this idea of, you know, where where these, these, these elite Jews, where they really saw themselves and, and how that identity functioned for them, and then also what was sort of what the reality was around them. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, it's important to remember that in the night, so basically after the French Revolution, which um, is unique for many reasons um, in history, but also because of the emancipation of the Jews in 1790, 1791, um, throughout the 19th century, um, you had, well, you had, that sort of Jewish emancipation, but then by the end of the late 19th century, um, after the Industrial Revolution and so on and so forth, sort of the rise of, of high finance and um, you know that sort of industry emerging um, on the scene, and um, many um, sort of self-made fortunes uh, proliferated in Paris, which was one of the sort of global hubs 
of finance, of, of I mean, it, it was also a seat of a major empire. So, you know, London was very similar. But, you know, you had this new class of people that was that, you know, that were not noble in origins. And, you know, there were many Protestants that were the same. There were any number of these kind of fortunes. And so the question for, for many in that class of wealthy but not titled people without pedigree, so to speak, was how to get a seat at the table in these societies that were still dominated by bloodlines and um, you know, family histories that, you know, that spooled all the way back to, in some cases in France, you know, the, the time of Clovis. So um, at the same time, it's worth remembering that in the late 19th century, after the sort of fall of the French nobility, there was a new art market where you had, for the first time, works that had previously been the exclusive province of the nobility or, you know, owned by the church or various nobles for sale. And so, in a way, buying these items, um, in the French case, you know, like the high watermark was the stuff in the Musée Camondo that I just mentioned, like the kind of 18th century pre-revolutionary Versailles style. So, you know, anything that the royals had touched, and specifically Marie Antoinette, had this real social valence to it. And if you own such an item, it was a way of, in a sense, purchasing pedigree. And I think that for many of these collectors, um, collecting was a means of assimilation, of presenting a sense of belonging in the society, whatever the society was. And you know, my research focuses on France specifically, um, and that's very much the story there. Um, there are similarities elsewhere, but I mean, it, it has a particular meaning in that context. I think also, though, you know, collecting is, um, you know, it's profoundly social in the sense that, you know, these elites, like I just said, are buying whatever they can find to create an image to display in public to give the sense that, you know, I am French, I belong here, I have just as much of a right to be here as does anyone else. But also, I mean, as we all know, um, collecting is profoundly psychological and you don't have to be wealthy to have um, uh, particular relationships with objects. You know, we all like certain things more than others. We all have our own weird individual tastes. And that's as true for these people as it is for, for all of us. And I think that with that in mind, you know, it's really important also to think about the context, at least in, in my little world of, of France at the, the, the late 19th century. I mean. The question of anti-Semitism is inescapable, and it was just absolutely aggressive and present everywhere that you went. And these, the characters in the book that I that I've written, you know, were all regularly attacked by name in the newspapers, in public debates, and they were kind of metaphors for what anti-Semites considered to be the Jewish menace. And so I think I. I think it's a mistake just to see the collections as a means of sort of presenting an image of belonging. I think it's also very much a sense of create of trying to create something beautiful and private in a deeply, deeply hostile environment. And in a sense, collection is a form of solace and of sanctuary. And I think that that's also very important. But anyway, I'm, I'm rambling. But that's um, that's a, a very brief attempt to sort of set the stage for the the moment we are in. And, and Lisa, you know, in your book, the book revolves around this painting, Woman on Fire. So can you tell us a little bit about both the specific painting in the novel and also sort of what it was inspired by? Because um, it does sort of dovetail a lot with, 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 what, with what James is talking about. No, it, it absolutely, absolutely does. Um, when I was reading James's book, um, I was really struck by how many of these collectors and famous paintings were actually children of these Jewish, you know, proprietors of all these, this the incredible art. And so very much in my book, the painting itself, Woman on Fire, is um, sort of uh, the last painting of an expressionist artist, uh, a fictional expressionist artist, who was the founder of the movement actually in my first book, Fugitive Colors, his name is Ernst Engel. And he was murdered by the Nazis and his very last painting was Woman on Fire. And so, um, you know, I really wanted to reflect the expressionist movement of art because as you may know, uh, the Nazis 
went after the avant-garde with a vengeance never seen before. And particularly the expressionists in Germany because they were homegrown. And more so because their art was fetching, you know, fetching big numbers. It was the it art of that time. And so interesting through my research, and I was researching the subject in 92. So this is before Woman on Gold, you know, writer, you know, Rape of Europa, a major book. And um, I had discovered at that point that Hitler and man, many of uh, his posse were involved in art or whether they were painters or sculptors or collectors or, you know, own galleries, but very involved in art. And so their art was very much, um, you know, uh, they, they shunned this expressionist art and they really wanted Germans where it began to look at art through the framework of what is art under Aryan art, which was not expressionist art, which is how a painting makes you feel, not the subject itself. And they were very threatened by these artists. So they went after them. And I really wanted my painting Woman on Fire to be reflective of that period of art. So, you know, the strokes are frenetic and, and wild and the painting um, is, is something that each of the characters, uh, and it's very, it's multi-generational, but how the painting makes each one of these characters feel. And so that was really important to me. Um, what I thought was interesting in James's book, um, he really sort of went into the before and then there was the Holocaust and I'm sort of the after, which is the painting and what's happening now. And I think it's so important to note, um, you know, why is stolen art and for lack of a better word, why is it trending right now? Why can you pick up the New York Times in the last couple months and you'll see no less than eight articles, um, major articles on stolen art. And I think it's what, you really get to in your book, which is that it's really about um, not so much the painting itself, but about a culturally rich community that was quashed. And that is what is happening here. And while the Nazis and the survivors are dwindling, um, they're, you know, the youngest survivors and Nazis are really in their late eighties. So what's left is the art and the assets. Mm. Yeah, I was really fascinated by how you treat the whole Gurlitt story in your novel. Um, and yeah, and you mentioned, I mean, I had a very similar experience um, reading that, I think probably that same Times piece about the, the discovery of the hoard. You know, I sort of refused right. to call yeah. it a collection because it's not a collection, it's a hoard, you know. Um, but I was wondering, I mean, I feel like, you know, we both in our books have written about um, elites, you know, and Stephanie just asked me to sort of explain that whole side of things. But in a sense, I think at, at least, you know, um, I had the great fortune of seeing both shows of the Gurlitt collection in, I think it was Bonn and Bern. There were two Bern. of them. Yeah. yeah, there were two sort of concurrent shows put on by the German government and Swiss government to sort of identify who might come forward and claim um these items and of course they didn't do nearly enough um work on that as they should have but i mean it was it was something and i just i remember being struck most of all by kind of the um how to put it like the kind of the quotidian nature of so many of the objects you know it's not all chagall a lot of it is just stuff like the the kind of mundane brutality of plunder it's like they just ripped paintings that had no value off of people's walls because they could and you know I, I sort of feel like one of the problems with my own book is that it focuses exclusively on elites when actually you know it wasn't just the elites that had this relationship to art and objects and I wonder you know in your research if you came across anything similar no I would agree with that I mean I think what I found is that you know it was sort of separated so the Nazis took the best of the works for themselves and for themselves and then they you know uh, you know, through Switzerland and through anonymous auctions, the Lucerne auction being the major auction in 1939, mm -hmm. um, they auctioned off the best of the works and then they took those profits of this degenerate art and they funneled it into the Nazi 
war machine. Mm -hmm. And so I think with the specific, the, the Gerlich collection, I think it was just about 40 pieces of the massive treasure trove, the hoard, which was 1500, upwards of 1500 works that they determined were stolen artwork. And, I, and that was after what, eight or nine years of investigating it. And I think there's a lot more to come. Uh, I just wanna throw in a positive. Um, you're seeing a lot more lately, and I don't know if you've had this experience in your research, but museums are finally coming forward with mm -hmm. stolen pieces. The Louvre, you know, just, uh, you know, they announced that they had, I think, I believe it was about 14 paintings that they determined to be stolen art. There's a lot of this coming forward um, and kind of coughing up uh, stolen artworks that have been in museums across the country for decades. And, you know, you know, through your research, and I know through my research, that almost any painting between 1933 and 1945 that had their, you know, provenance wiped out, their history wiped out, should be suspect and looked at. And so, you know, it's right now we're in very interesting times. I feel like it's a new phase, a new wave with um, stolen art that maybe return to their rightful owners or the family of. And really right now we're looking at the grandkids who are coming and the great grandkids who are trying to seek restitution of the, these artworks. So it's, uh, we're in a really interesting time with stolen art. I think especially when you put it in the context of the museum, I mean, James, your book starts with the sort of the tiny little plaques that are outside the Commando Museum. Will you tell us a little bit about that and the perspective they offer? Yeah, um, I mean, so the Camondo Museum, like I mentioned, is one of several of these amazing kind of house museums donated by Jewish families to France before the Second World War. And so they all have these kind of marble plaques in some way, shape or form saying, you know, this museum donated to the state by, the, you know, Moise de Camondo in 1934, opened on this day, so on and so forth. And then underneath, um, in that particular instance, it's in the there's a sort of porte cochere coming off the street into the little courtyard. There's a, another plaque underneath that was added, we think, in the 1960s, maybe early 70s. That's kind of an afterthought that says, oh, and by the way, the daughter and grandchildren of the founder were all murdered in Auschwitz. And um, that's kind of a, a recurring theme. I mean, and, and in many cases, you know, the other museums don't even say that much. So for instance, the kind of in-laws of the Camondos, the family called the Rhinox, um, I mean, truly, basically the William Henry and Alice James of their time in, in France. I mean, just like so important intellectually, they were all in parliament, they were all governors of the big museums. I mean, it's impossible to sort of overstate their significance. And now um, there's a there's a villa in the south of France that that um, they donated to the state, which I know is in Lisa mentioned is in one of her previous novels, which I must read now. Um, and you know it it mentions that it was donated by the Rhinox, but it doesn't mention, for for instance, that you know the Nazis literally came into the house and destroyed many of the items in it in the 1940s. So the house itself is like a site of the persecution. Um, also, in, in the suburbs of Paris, there's a kind of wealthy, leafy suburb called Saint-Germain-en-Laye, and that was the sort of the Reinach family seat. And when I was a PhD student, there was a kind of crumbling old plaque in their honor saying, you know, the Reinachs lived here and these are all of their names and dates, etc. And then um, when I was finishing Fragile Things and sort of fact checking, I went back to check and that um, plaque had actually been taken down. Um, in the course of some kind of construction project. And there are no plans to put it back up, which sort of tells you everything you need to know. Um, and then the same is true at basically all these other museums. So it's a question of like how we look at these spaces, right? They are both great. If you are a student of 18th century decorative arts, these are museums for you. They will, you know, there, there is a lot to learn there about, you know, Fragonard, Boucher, Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun, whatever. Um, but then if you're interested in European history or Jewish history, there are these other levels at the same time. And like the plaques or lack of plaques, um, as the case may be, are sort of testaments of that. And it's, it's interesting that in many of these cases, 
we sort of care more about the family apartments and the you know the the traces of the real people that lived there than we do now about the collections themselves which is also an interesting question given that the families themselves were so adamant that the collections be admired but today we come mostly looking for them and that's I mean, they, they could never have intended or imagined um, a landscape in which that was the case, but it's true. It's also I, so, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 I was no just add, Yeah, I was just gonna add, I think that that was my goal. I mean, my book is obviously suspenseful and there's fiction and there's, you know, passion, but my goal was to sort of utilize one painting to represent exactly what James is talking about that, you know, one painting will showcase the more than 600,000 works of art that the Nazis looted, destroyed, confiscated. And almost that number is inconceivable. But when you put it into one painting and how it affects all these people, that my goal was uh, that the reader, you know, whether they're Jewish or not, would have a takeaway, would really understand uh, the impact of this art on these families and what happened to it. And I, I think that it's just so important and it's so heartbreaking that, you know, what's left of these great lives is sort of this dusty plaque. And then in the case that you're talking about that it's not even there, a plaque to recognize an entirely, you know, a full rich cultural life and what they gave to the state. Uh, it, it's just, it's so, um, heartbreaking in in many ways. Yeah, but, and you know, I agree. Yeah. I agree totally. But I mean, at the same time, what's also I think the key is that you know people's relationships to objects are different, and and they do give us something of the person, right? Because you know the the way that we relate to objects and things is different than, for instance, the way we relate to texts that we might even be the author of in some cases. And so, you know, it's a real like for the case of the Camondo, the fact that these objects meant so much to Moise de Camondo and to his daughter. I mean that that tells us a lot about them, even though we have no idea what exactly it means, but we know it means something. It's a, it's the physical, uh, or the rather, the, I should say the material traces of, of a person and that it's not nearly enough, but on the same, on the other hand, it is something. And I, I just, I guess I tried to take solace in that um, because at the end of the day, for, for my project at least, there's just all this stuff you will never know. And it's so frustrating. And I'm sure it's the same for, for, for Lisa too. I mean, when, when, when you're, you're basically reporting the past, you know, we, we both come from journalistic backgrounds and like at the end of the day, there's just nothing you can find out after a certain amount of time and a certain amount of research. And I think it it's it's a kind of enduring mystery, right? Like, why did this person like this painting or like this couch or like this this vase so much? And you know, we don't know why, but that's kind of in a way, it's it's like the final property that these people who have long vanished still control, um, like their relationship to whatever object it is. And I guess um, that's kind of incredible that 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 survives in some sense although i mean it's it's a very little thing but it's still something well with art in particular i mean if we think about there was so much material so much property that was that was plundered but with art you can, you can look at a painting and say someone else looked at this this very painting this meant something to someone i think that's sort of what both of you are saying it's really easy to connect to these people's stories right mm -hmm. and and uh, the com competing claims to them right like in in your book, Lisa, there's, you know, the heirs of the, the gallerists who who bought the painting and tried to save it before the war. There's the heirs of the people who were in the painting and bought the painting. Um, and I I think it's just there's a reason we've we've latched onto these stories in the news and why those those troves uncovering those troves are, are so those hordes are so horrific, right? Because it, it, it we think of art as being sort of held to Almost like a higher standard, but we realized that actually this was just sort of something that was pillaged. You know, there's a term that you define, James, and that actually expresses itself in your book, Lisa, and it's material anti-Semitism. I have never heard that before. It was fascinating. Could you tell us what that term means and sort of how it plays into these, the, first of all, the, the, these, these French Jewish families and sort of the, the stigma they almost couldn't get past, and then, of course, how it sort of plays out today? 
Yeah, um, I mean, what I meant by the term is basically, so I think just to back up a minute, I think that, you know, when we talk about anti-Semitism and the long history of anti-Semitism, we're really talking about different, many different versions of the same hatred, the same hatred being that it is a hatred of Jews, but that it's often, you know, it means different things in different times. So, you know, Voltaire hated the Jews because he claimed that he hated religious um, kind of observance and Jews were religiously observant and sort of anti-enlightenment in his view. And, you know, there is the racialist anti-Semitism of Hitler, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of different, different iterations of the same story. But what I tried to do was look very closely at what the actual discourse was in the period I was writing about, the late 19th century in France. And I found that so much of the public um, hatred of Jews, the sort of the anti-Semitic Semitic rhetoric that was available in the newspapers, in the press, in reviews, in just sort of casual everyday life was material in the sense that it attacked Jews as others or as fake Frenchmen or fake fake French women or sort of ersatz citizens through the language of art and objects, which is really weird. I just, I mean, it's like a very specific way into the, to the discussion, but that was so present. And I think that one of the reasons it was that way was that, you know, the 19th century in France was this kind of constant shift between revolution and reaction. And so, cultural patrimony and you know the like what was truly France and who truly owned it was central and so objects became objects and art became the kind of battleground for the soul of the nation and thus you know who had the right to own or curate these objects was of crucial importance and so many anti-semites like I write a lot in the book about Edouard Drummond who was like the most kind of vitriolic anti-semite in Europe probably before Hitler um, and he, um, at least in terms of sort of his writings and his sort of political movements that he tried to inspire, um, he you know, really went after all of these um, these families and others through the objects that they own. So you know, he has his he wrote this kind of best selling book called La France Juive, Jewish France in the late 19th century that, by the way, made the publishing house Flammarion, which is still around today. It made the, it put, it, it put them on the map. It was like the best selling thing they ever published. Um, and it, it literally is like a kind of catalog of every Jewish family through the objects and the houses that they owned and the art that they owned but couldn't appreciate. And this was his way in. And I think that that means something. Like it was so, it was very much the kind of the, the lifeblood of the times. And I, I just, um, I find that fascinating. But it's this attempt to sort of other Jews through the objects and the art that they may have been attracted to. And then I think it works the other way in the sense that because of that, for so many of these families, art and objects became a really important means of showing their belonging. And it was a way of making their case, but it's the language of the discussion either way. And that's, I don't know what I, I, I just was really struck by that. Well, it's interesting, like they couldn't win, right? You, you could right. get these classical items, but then someone would come to your house and be like, a Rothschild, this is tacky. There was sort of almost like a tackiness oh. ascribed to it. Or Lisa, as you were saying, you could go avant-garde, but then that's degenerate. You know, like you're sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't. And so, I don't know, I think this idea of the way art is so identifiable, right? So if you see that, and, and it's so, it's so dependent on context, right? You could see the same thing in two different homes. If one was a Jewish home, you might say all of these things about it, right? It's not supposed to be there. It's There's almost an inauthenticity in a Jewish space somehow. Yeah. And, and Lisa, you know, in, the, in your book, there's the scene recalled in a diary of the gallerist who's half Jewish and he, sort of an, an almost identical comment is made to him, right? Like, you don't appreciate this or this is, doesn't deserve to be here. Right, or even that he had the uh, Charles de Laurent, he doesn't deserve the participle, the DE <laughs> in his name. Uh, and that, you know, what did he do to deserve this? And yet he was, he had the most opulent, most beautiful uh, gallery in Paris and, you know, close with everyone. But then when it came down to it, he didn't deserve the participle, you know, the, the DE in his name. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, I, I really do think it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't. So what do you do? You know, and in the end, 
you know, you, you know, uh, they tried to fit in so much, but they were in the end, everything was taken from them. And, you know, James, I, I felt like it was really described and especially the various families, the Rothschilds, I think you had in your book where many of them were in different countries and some of them fighting against each other. And they were told to fight for whichever country that they were living in. And there was just so much of, you know, assimilate. And in the end, it really doesn't matter. And, and I mean, which, you know, was showcased, uh, you know. And in, in my book, um, you know, getting back to something you had talked about earlier, the fact is that the painting was actually the main character's mother. I mean, there's no way around it, you know, and, 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 and that's, that, you know, they could say it doesn't belong to him, uh, you know, it doesn't belong, you know, that a museum can have this painting, but in fact, it was his mother. So, you know, it's just, and in your book, I think it was, um, who was it, uh, Irene, the the little girl. The yeah, that, that you really discussed at length. And here was her daughter uh, and trying to get the painting back. And that's how she was able to get the painting back but then sold it very quickly, which was upsetting and disturbing, you know, but that's a whole side story. Yeah. Um, so it's just very interesting, the art of that period and what it meant to people and, uh, you know, what it comes down to now with restitution, you're seeing now a major case in the Supreme Court uh, of a Pissarro uh, right now that a family has been trying to get it back for 20 years. So it's just, it's going to be interesting, I would say, in the next, you know, decade, how uh, stolen art, if it's going to, uh, you know, uh, be reinstated, our family's going to be getting it back, you know, what's going to happen? I mean, I know I'm following it closely, for yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, you know, a question came in uh, asking for clarification uh, to you, James, uh, these houses, these museums that were donated, were they actually donated or were they, you know, because we're talking about two different things here, sort of stolen art and then art that was donated mm -hmm. and then families who perished. So could you sort of clarify the, the distinction there? Yeah, absolutely. So in my case, um, and as Lisa said, you know, our, our books kind of are on two sides of the, the story. So mine is kind of the before and hers is the after, um, but absolutely. So in my book, it's basically five families and five museums donated willingly by the families as tokens of appreciations to France for various um, various reasons, but largely for you know everything that they had basically grateful immigrants um, giving back however they could. And so these museums were donated all between sort of the mid 1920s and the mid 1930s, and they opened publicly as museums before the war. So. Um, it wasn't really to do with anything political in that sense, and it was it was it was you know the genuine desire of, um, in most cases, the patriarch, but in one case that I write about, the matriarch of the family to do so, and so it was a kind of collective gesture in support of this nation that they saw so much in, and that of course later betrayed them. It's so depressing. Is it? It's like it's really just heartbreaking to read these stories, and you know what's going to happen to this family. And they say we're we're French, we're we're Jewish, but we're also French, and that that universality, that particularity, that they can coexist. And yeah. we sort of learn that ultimately they they can. Yeah, it really is heartbreaking. Um, and you know, I I struggle with that so much because you know I totally agree with you. And you know, I grew up. Um, you know, here in America, you know, um, in a certain moment in time where, you know, there's no, and you know, there's no moment in my life that I didn't know how the story ended. You know, it's been a part of, of my life forever. I mean, as it has, I'm sure for all of us, we all grow up hearing about this. We know what happens, we know how it ends, but the thing is they didn't, and there was no template and they had no idea what was going to happen. And the trick for me writing the story was not to project my own biases and perspectives onto them and to try my best, and I'm sure I slipped at certain points, to see the world as they saw it, um, which seemed to me the fairest thing to do, but it was really frustrating at times. I mean, especially for these people of means who had families that they might very well have saved if they had left, but they didn't. Um, it's just devastating.
you know, I just want to say, so I, I am a, da a daughter of a Holocaust survivor and um, my grandmother in particular was my best friend. And, you know, I grew up in suburbia and I had, you know, sort of this backstory. So I wish I could say that I was trying to be a little bit more even handed. I, I would think, you know, if I had to be honest, I probably wasn't, you know, like I had that fire in me. I had sort of that, you know, uh, second generation anger and, and you know, trying to get the, uh, the painting back and the real fight for it and trying to right the wrongs. And so I, you know, it, it's just, I, it, it's a different experience, I would think, being someone who's doing the research and a non-fictional um, type of story, as opposed to where I can go there, you know, with whatever character, you know, whether it's Margot, who's sort of the evil character, but she does have one soft spot, uh, and that's her connection to the painting relating to her grandfather and the legacy. And so I, I would, I think that I'm different in that way, that it was a very fiery experience, I would say, writing the book. You, you were a woman on fire. I was a woman on fire writing <laughs> about a woman on fire, basically. And I will say like your book, it's, it's a sexy thriller. It is not all depressing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I don't yeah. want to sell it short. Um, you know, we have a lot of questions from people who basically say, I love both of these books. These sound amazing. What are you working on next? And I don't know if writers like to get that question. Um, seems like you probably get it a lot. So what are the two of you working on next? Uh, so um, every time I try to get away from World War II, I'm pulled right back in. So I am writing um, uh, a book about an American actress, a legendary American actress with a secret past, uh, a dark secret past that's connected to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Oh. Um, that, I will definitely look out for that. Um, <laughs> I have just begun and um, I have a, my new project is a book in brief about the fight for Holocaust memory immediately after the war, looking at those battles in a few different places. It's a huge topic, so it won't be absolutely everything, but just um, a few of the key battles and how those played out and what legacies they have left us today as we try and remember other atrocities. Well, I appreciate you both keeping it on theme because I think we'll be back here in a few years when your books come out to talk about them um, with the Jewish Museum and the Jewish Book Council. Someone is asking um, about any perspective the two of you have on the process of recovering looted art. They share a story about their own battle. I'm sure this is something you you hear a lot when you talk about your, your books, people who are trying to recover lost or stolen property. Any advice? Uh, any advice? Well, I mean, it's a tough battle and it's a tough battle, even if you have all the means in the world to get your painting back, the financial means. I had a friend uh, and her father was a major art dealer in Paris. Uh, she's, and um, it took her nine years to get a particular uh, painting back, which happened to have been in the girl at treasure trove. But this is someone who had all the means in the world, uh, the legal, you know, means armed with everything. And it's a tough, tough fight. And so, you know, obviously, you, you know, um, interestingly, I, I, I digress a little bit, but in the book, um, I have this Nazi art hunter who is inspired by an incredible art hunter, his name is Arthur Brand, and he's sort of the Indiana Jones in the art world. I, you've probably come across him because every time I would look for something, every, all of my research ended with Arthur Brand. And so my art dealer, Nazi art hunter is based on him, but someone like that who has experience, if you really have the evidence at hand that you are, that this is your painting and you're trying to get it back, I would try, I would go to the top, whoever I could get behind me to try to make it happen. I like that. You know, yeah. we're gonna have to wrap it up soon, but I want to ask you a question since I have both of you, um, the week of Passover, 
you both are writing about you know material culture the importance of material culture to jewish culture and the fact that we shouldn't look down on it right we shouldn't dismiss these things and say oh it's just art it's just you know it's something sort of uh frivolous it's actually i think accepting the fact and embracing the fact that it's an important part of jewish ritual and jewish life um and all 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 culture so what can we take I, this is sort of maybe out of left field a little bit but you know as we sit down to our tables as we look at these seder plates that may have been passed down maybe brand new and maybe baroque you know sort of all 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 different styles we might be seeing is there anything that we can learn from these families and from these stories um about what it means what our objects mean to us hmm. no it's a uh, go ahead james you want that one <laughs> um, I will think about that one for a second. You can a little hot potato I, over here. <laughs> I, you know, I just feel, I mean, it's it's no secret. We all know that there's a a, a, a tremendous rise in anti-Semitism right now. There's, you know, we all know that it's happening. So it's probably very important that that is discussed in the framework of whatever the objects are, or you know. Um, and, and I feel, and I, I go back to this, that it's very important to stand up, to fight, to, you know, whatever it is. If it was my artwork and uh, my family's uh, art or something that was reflective of their lives before, which is James's territory, but I would do whatever it took to fight to get it back to my family. And I think, uh, yeah, I mean, especially what's going on just as a side in Ukraine, uh, you know, there was a major article about how the the art community is working night and day to protect the art in Ukraine, bearing it, you know, very similar to what had happened in the Louvre and other places when they were smuggling and hiding major artworks, but that's going on right now actually. So um, I know that's a little bit out there, all different, you know, ways of tackling your question. But I think at the end of the day, uh, it really is important to fight and do whatever you can if it's important to you to get what to, you know, to have to fight for whatever it was, whether it's an object or an asset to bring it back to your home and your family and the legacy of the survivors. Yeah, I totally agree. You said that much better than I could. Um, I would just add to Stephanie's question. I think, um, you know, for obvious reasons, which you were alluding to just a minute ago, art and sort of material culture has been neglected in, um, you know, uh, forays into the Jewish past. And I think, I mean, that that's changed, you know, with the likes of historians like Richard Cohen um, and, and others in recent years, but I just think that, um, you know, it, so the, the art, for instance, that I write about in my book is art that, that Jews collected, um, and that they found meaning in, and that, um, you know, their families either, um, struggle to get back today or, or are in the process of getting back, but there's a whole other world of, um, of art that Jews created and that has sort of always been there and that has never really been given as much attention as it deserves. So I think, you know, my hope is that in, in the coming years, you know, that might that might change. And I think it 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 already is. I mean, the signs are there, but I mean I think there's much, much more work to be done in that space. And so I think um, you know, to answer your question, I would just say that I think it it's it would be it would be wonderful if more um, scholars and researchers would, would look into that because it is, I mean, art is such an important aspect of how we all experience the world. And that's as true for Jewish history as it is for virtually any history. So I, I think um, the time is right for more attention to be paid. But first, everyone should read these two books. Right, right? first, these are uh, two objects that you should certainly collect right away. Yes, right. two <laughs> collector's items, Woman on Fire, The House of Fragile Things. Lisa and James, it is a pleasure to speak with both of you. You both are so smart and passionate, and it's really, really great to talk with you. Thank, Thank you so much for having so, us, so giving wonderful. us.
And yeah. thank you to the Jewish Book Council and the Jewish Museum. We will be back here in May with Gary Steingart and Claire Stanford talking about happiness in the time of technology, something a little bit different. Um, but it's been wonderful to be here with all of you tonight, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. There are links to buy the books, go see the museum, go learn about the Jewish Book Council in the chat. So you can grab those. And um, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.